all have a picture of ourselves, of who we are, of who we think we are, of who we want others to think we are. But that picture is often distorted. Distorted because our hearts deceive us. Distorted because we want people to think we're doing better than we really are. Distorted because we let our past, our careers, our relationships define us, instead of looking to the one who gave us a name and called us his own. We all have a picture of ourselves, an identity we hide behind. But who do you say you are? What defines your identity? And could it be that God sees something different? We live in a very performance-minded culture, do we not? We want to know that the people in position over us on the org chart have earned that position, that they're not there by accident. We want to know that their title and their pay grade is based on their experience or expertise, not based on who they knew when they were interviewing. We want the assurance that the people around us are working just as hard as us just as worthy as us. It's why we're so cynical about people who grew up having everything handed to them. Why we're so cynical about the trust fund baby or the silver spoon in the mouth or the fact that they now run the company because their daddy used to be on the board. We hate those stories. We would much rather relish and celebrate the story of someone who pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps because we live in a performance-based culture, constantly wanting people to prove their worth by their work. But we don't just live with this mindset in the professional space. We also carry this mindset into the spiritual space as well. We can have a real tendency to live with a performance-based mindset when it comes to our walk with God. We can very much live with a performance-based mindset when it comes to our identity and our standing before him. See, when it comes to our walk with God, many of us are operating as though our worth is connected somehow to our work. Many of us believe that the measure of our devotion has a bearing on the measure of God's love, as though his acceptance is tied to my obedience. Really what we do is then we base our identity, our standing before God, on what we do in devotion to him, our obedience to him. How good a Christian am I? How good a Christian are you? Are you following Jesus like I'm following Jesus? And then I'll grade you or you'll grade me based on our obedience. But the gospel tells us something decidedly different. What we're going to see today is that obedience is about honoring our identity, not earning it. And we see this in Paul's writings in a little letter called Galatians. So grab your Bibles and turn with me to Galatians, Galatians chapter 3. Uh, We've been working our way through this series, uh, establishing a biblical theology of identity, I call it. We we started in Genesis. We're working our way now through the New Testament. We've we've been looking at how God looks at us. We've been looking at at where we get our standing, what those things are grounded and rooted in. And so beginning in the beginning, we started talking about what we do, our, our jobs and how we identify ourselves by what we do. But now we're looking at how we perform, and even this sense that I need to be obedient in order to earn something from God. Paul writes this letter then to help flesh this out, because an error has been made, a myth has been believed, a lie has been bought into in Galatia. Galatia is a region, not a city. It was a region of many cities on the northern side of the Mediterranean Sea, north of Israel. It's where the gospel had gone and been received by Gentiles, meaning non Jews, mostly Greeks in that region, some Romans, they had come to embrace the gospel of Jesus, but somewhere along the way, some Jews came up and had convinced them that while it was great that they had embraced Jesus, they also needed to embrace Judaism, and they also needed to embrace the Old Testament law. 
Essentially, they were saying, hey, great that you've come to Jesus, but if you really want to be sons and daughters, if you really want to be embraced by God in the kingdom fully, then you also need to embrace these things. It was an obedience-based mentality, a belief that their standing before God was somehow measured or weighted contingent on their performance. And so Paul writes to address this problem. Pick it up with me, Galatians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Paul writes, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith, just as Abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness? Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. So Paul is writing this letter to this church that had come and understood the gospel, embraced Jesus, but now is suddenly doubting their identity, doubting their standing before God, and they've been led to believe that they need to do in order to earn. And he begins then with a rebuke. Oh, foolish Galatians, you foolish Galatians. In fact, two times in this passage, Paul calls them fools. Here, verse 1, then again in verse 3. Is Paul just being rude? No. Fool actually is a, a biblical term. It's a term used in the scriptures for the person who actively disregards God and his instruction. It's called a fool. Take, for example, Psalm 14.1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Or or Proverbs 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, wisdom, knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. What the scriptures are saying is that to honor God is to listen to him, but you are a fool if you disregard his instruction. So Paul isn't saying this just to smack the Galatians a new one. He's saying them this to wake them up with a biblical label so that they'd be arrested to the fact that they are disregarding the instruction that God has given them, the wisdom of the scriptures. It's wise to listen, and it's foolish to ignore. That's why he says, who has bewitched you? Who, who seduced you into thinking something else, that the gospel was anything else? You knew the truth, but now you're disregarding and turning from the gospel And what are they turning to? He says in verse 2 and 3. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Essentially, Paul's asking, hey, do you have standing before God because of what you've done and how you've lived and obeyed or simply because you placed your faith in Jesus? That's the dominant question. And it's a rhetorical question. Paul's asking it as a rhetorical question because, and he acknowledges, you know the gospel, but you've turned from it. You know the truth of the gospel, that it is by faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, Paul spells this out so clearly. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not your own doing, it is a gift of God. Not by works, lest anyone boast. But Paul's saying, somehow you've been fooled into thinking that you can contribute and that your standing is based somehow on what you are doing. 
And so he asks that crushing question in verse 3. Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? That word perfected in the Greek means accomplished or or to be fully completed. What, What Paul is saying is, hey, do you actually believe that God, having started this work in your life, grabbed a hold of you by the Spirit, that now you're completing the work by your own hands? Do you actually believe that what was begun by God can be finished by you? Perfected as though somehow what God did wasn't quite perfect and he needs your help to get you the rest of the way. And again, he's pressing on this because the Galatians had begun to believe that their obedience kind of helped their standing. Their, Their standing before God was nudged along by their obedience now to the law. And it wasn't just a works-based gospel. What I want to help you understand today from this scripture is that it's an obedience-based identity that they were falling into. I am loved because of what I do. I have standing because of how I have performed. See, here's the thing, here's the thing. Obedience-based identity believes that God's view of me rises or falls based on my obedience. Obedience-based identity is this thinking, this line of thinking, that God's view of me, his love for me in any given moment, rises or falls based on my performance, my obedience. So God really loves me today because I woke up early And I didn't yell at the kids, and we made it to church on time. But you know what? Last week, God was angry with me because I didn't really spend much time with him, and I yelled at the kids, and I was just mad at life. Obedience-based identity says that somehow how God views me, my standing before him, the ground on which I stand, it rises or falls based on what I bring to the table So the more I obey, the more I am loved. The more I obey, the more God will bless. And when I don't obey, that parking spot doesn't open up. When I don't obey, then man, we struggle financially. When I haven't been walking with God, well, this is why we're having marriage difficulties now. God's just, you know, getting back at me. Or God's just mad because I haven't been walking. I sinned last night. Obedience-based identity believes then that I am loved or not loved based on what I do or don't do, not because of who I am in Christ. That's why Paul asks, who has bewitched you? Meaning, who has sucked you in and duped you and pulled you into this train of thought? Because the Galatians in this moment have come to believe that they are second-class citizens And riding in first class are all those people who are following all of the law and they're able to follow the law perfectly. And if the Galatians could just follow the law like they follow the law, then they would be as as loved as the Jews. They would be as beloved. They would be as chosen. They would be like that. We still hear echoes of obedience-based identity in the church today. Obedience-based identity sounds like this. Oh, your church is like that. Oh, your church believes that. But my church, my church believes this. My church has this, and it's so more holy because we have this in our theology. Or, or, or it believes this, that God is more pleased with my kind of worship than your kind of worship. You you sing those kinds of songs, but I sing these kinds of songs. Therefore, God honors my worship more than he honors your worship. When what do the scriptures say about worship and Jesus' own teaching on worship, that our worship is based on spirit and truth, not sound or tempo. But so often an obedience-based identity says, And prides itself in being in some kind of class that is other than someone else based on how I do something in the faith. Obedience-based identity says, 
that if you read the Bible through in an entire year, you'll have greater standing with Jesus than if you fall short. Obedience-based identity is constantly looking to earn a little bit more. It's an identity then that ultimately trusts more in our own work than it does in Jesus' work. So what does Paul do? Paul corrects not just their view of the gospel, but he ties it back to their identity in Christ. Listen again to what he says, verses 7 through 9. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. If you're a note taker, a highlighter, please note how many times now he is pointing back to faith in this passage, above and over obedience or works. Paul's reminding the Galatians that the gospel has an identity for them that is independent of works. He says right there in verse 7, it is those of faith who are what? Sons. Sons is an identity label, not a performance label. Sons and daughters is an identity label. It is a gift to you, not based on your performance. My children do not have to earn the title of son or daughter. My son didn't earn that title because he beat out all the other kids in the nursery. In fact, quite the opposite. What do we tell our children all of the time, right? That I love you no matter what. That you can't change that. You can be mad at me. You can slam the door at me. You can run off and tell me that you hate me. But it doesn't change my love for you. See, sonship Daughtership in the kingdom is an identity that is given, not earned. And it's by faith that we become sons and daughters. I love the way that Timothy Keller so simply puts it. Timothy Keller parsing out this and parsing out culture says, religion says my identity is built on being a good person. Whereas the gospel says, my identity is not built on my record, but on Christ's. The gospel says, my identity, standing son, daughter, is based not on my record, not on my performance, not on how I've done, but rather on what Jesus has done for me. Period. End of sentence. The problem is, though, we confuse it. Just like the Galatians, we get bewitched and we fall into wrong thinking. See, Paul, Paul in this is pointing to a theology, a part of our theology that is so critically important, and yet it's a part of our theology that so many Christians confuse, diminish, or minimize. What is Paul doing? Paul is pointing to justification by faith. He says this in verse 8, that, we would, that God would justify the Gentiles by what? By faith, not by works. Justified, justified means to have a standing before God. Means to make right. You may have a footnote in your translation. If you look down at the bottom of the page, you may have a footnote that says to declare right or righteous. That's what justified means. That because of your faith in Jesus, you are declared right or declared righteous by God. Meaning you are complete You are perfect. Nothing more is needed. The problem is many of us don't live like nothing more is needed. The problem is many of us don't live as though we are complete and Jesus has done all of the work. And this is borne out even in how we talk about the gospel and the analogies that we use in speaking about the gospel. See, when we speak about the gospel, we'll often tell people, and it is an image from Scripture, but we hold it incompletely. We'll tell people that, that, yeah, because of sin, there is a debt. And it's a debt that we could not pay, a debt that we owe before God. We are all in debt. And so we're starting from over here in debt, 
But we tell people, we look at the scriptures that Jesus Christ was given by the Father to live a perfect life. He went to the cross on our behalf in order to pay our debt of sin. And we stop there. And that's a problem. It's a problem then because in our thinking with debt, when we have a credit card paid off, we think of debt and speak of debt and so often then think of our spirituality as being this thing where Jesus has just gotten us back to zero. When you pay off that car, when you pay off that mortgage, when you scream, I'm debt free, Dave Ramsey fans out there, you think of debt from the standpoint of being back to zero. I was in the hole and now I am out of the hole. But from that point, then we're like, now we got to start saving money. Now we got to start saving for college. Now we got to save for retirement. So we view debt as the zero sum thing that Jesus just gets us back to zero. And we then come into our spirituality thinking then that because Jesus has paid our debt, we are now morally neutral before God. Wrong thinking. Jesus didn't pay our debt so that we might be morally neutral back to zero and then somehow work and earn to gain favor and standing before God. No, what the scriptures actually say and what the gospel preaches is that Jesus not only paid our debt, but then he imputed on us his righteousness. Imputed, meaning he gave to us all of his righteousness while he took on himself all of our sin and our debt. Therefore, because we have all of his righteousness, we're not just back to a morally neutral zero. We have become and we have been given the riches of glory. You didn't just get out of debt. You became a millionaire in Jesus Christ. You didn't just get out of debt. You have been given glory. You have been made co-heirs with Jesus Christ. There is nothing that you lack. Because you have been granted so much more than you could ever have given to yourself. The gospel is that there is a fullness of righteousness granted to you. And what the Spirit began, God is not waiting on you to complete and finish. You are perfect and complete, lacking in nothing, the scriptures say, because of Jesus. This is a gospel identity. And the problem is we often think that we have to help get us just a little bit further. It's legalism. Legalism says and believes this. Legalism is the belief that we can make ourselves acceptable to God through our obedience to the rules. Legalism says I'm a better Christian than you because of what I do. But Paul says that's a misnomer. That is a wrong label, an inaccurate designation. Because our standing before God is not improved by our effort. Our standing before God is guaranteed based on Christ's effort. Now some of you are super nervous right now. Because if this is true, am I just leaving the door open that we don't have to obey? I mean, hurry up, Drew, close that door before someone runs through it. And thinks that they can just live however they want. They can just do however they want. Does this mean that obedience doesn't play a role in the Christian life? Absolutely not. That is not what I am saying. And that is not what the scriptures say. The scriptures absolutely call us to honor God. To walk in a manner worthy. Jesus calls us and gives us a command that we are to accomplish here on earth. So what is the role and the point and the purpose of obedience then? Look with me at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, because Paul makes this really clear in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Paul writes this, and we'll put it on the screen so you can follow along. Paul says this, I appeal to you there." For brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, 
that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul, in the book of Romans, which we looked at recently, spelled out the gospel for us that we're all in sin. We are all in need of Jesus Christ's perfect sacrifice. We can't make it on our own, and it is by grace through faith then that we are saved. But then he calls us to live in such a way. I appeal to you, therefore, I want you to live towards the mercies. I want you to present yourselves to God. Why? I want you to present your God, yourself to God because it is your spiritual worship, he says. Presenting ourselves to God is about spiritual worship. It means that when we present ourselves to God and we seek to honor him with our lives, it is about gratitude. If you take anything away from the sermon this weekend, I want you to take away this, this one thing, this one thing. Obedience, then, is about honoring your identity, not earning it. Obedience is about honoring your identity, not earning it. That we follow Jesus, we walk in his ways, we walk according to what he has called and modeled for us. Not to earn standing or favor, to try to shake another yes from the prayer tree. God, please answer this prayer. Have I done enough? No, we honor him because of what he has already given us in Jesus. Because we who were destitute and deserving of nothing have been given everything. Because we who were far off have been brought near and made sons and daughters. Because our sins have been washed away and removed as far as east is from the west. And so we are not seeking to earn anything. We are seeking to simply worship in gratitude for all that Jesus has already done. And worship then in this context is about how you live, not just a few songs that you sing. Worship is about giving Jesus our everything because he has already bought and purchased our lives at great, great price. See, obedience is about honoring our identity. It's about living into what Jesus has already done. It's about the gratitude of knowing that this cost him so much and we deserve so little. Think about it this way. Paul uses these family images calling us sons by faith. We've been made sons along with Abraham who himself had faith in God. So think about it this way. From a family standpoint, let's imagine you're walking down the street and you meet this kid. They've been living on the street They've been fending for themselves, and you have this, you know, flashback of little orphan Annie, and you want to pull them out of this environment, and, and so you, you seek to take them up and bring them in, but they've been spending their whole life stealing and uh, pickpocketing and conning people just to buy bread, and it's tugged at your heart, so you grab them, and you do all the paperwork, you pay all the money to, to file for adoption so that they would be yours, so that you would stand in that courtroom and that day that judge would declare, it's gotcha day we call it, where he would declare that you now belong to them, they belong to you, you are formally a son or a daughter. Imagine that you go to all of that work to bring that child out of that environment, but then you get them back home and you notice that there's still a little bit of street in your child. They're struggling to really embrace and live into this. And so soon you start seeing those same subtle behaviors, the lying, the deceit. You see them grabbing at food and sneaking it back to their room in their pockets. You see them conning their siblings just to earn things. You see them you know, pointing fingers at the other siblings trying to outprove and outperform. There's they're still a little street in that little child. As a parent, what do you do in that moment? As a parent, you, you take them off, take them separately, you take them up to their room, and you have that conversation. And you tell them the thing that every parent tells a child that is struggling and acting out. There is nothing that you can do that will make me love you less. 
and there's nothing that you can do that will make me love you more. You don't need to do that. You don't need to point. You don't need to steal. You don't need to con because I love you. You are here. You're not going anywhere. I'm not going to get rid of you. I am not sending you away. But then you also say the other thing that we tell our children when they're struggling and acting out. Hey, you're a part of this family, and this is not how our family acts. We have family values, and now that you are mine, I'm calling you to live into our family values. We don't lie. We don't cheat. And I'm not calling you to do this so that you earn anything. I'm calling you because now you bear my name. And in this home, leavers don't do drama. That's one of our rules. Leavers don't talk back. Leavers forgive. The Mitchells are gracious. The Smiths are kind. Our family value, this is how we operate as a family. And what do we do in that moment? We call that child further into the family, not to earn their identity, but simply to honor what they've already been given. Because they bear a new name. You bear the name of of Jesus. He is calling you to live now as his son or daughter, to walk away from how you've been walking, to step away from that relationship that you know is not honoring to God, and to walk in a manner worthy, not so that you might become a son or a daughter, but because you already are. And he calls sons and daughters to walk in line with family values as a way of honoring the great sacrifice that Jesus has made. See, obedience is about honoring our identity. It's a way of showing that we are a part now of the family. So what do we do with this? What do we do with this as we close? What's the takeaway? Let me give three simple, really simple takeaways as we close. First takeaway is this. Live like a son, not a servant. We get this so wrong in our heads. We, we live and we operate as servants. The scriptures call us to live like a son, not a servant. Forgive me, ladies, or live like a daughter. But I'm a pastor. It has to alliterate. I needed two S's or two D's, and I couldn't come up with another D for daughter. So live like a son, live like a daughter, not like a servant. You're now a servant of Jesus to live out your life honoring him, not earning anything from him. And we've got to get in our heads this mentality that it's not contingent on me. Jesus isn't waiting for me to make a move so that he can bless me. I've already been blessed with the riches of glory, the riches of Jesus, sinless, spotless blood shed for me. I've already earned everything and I'm fully beloved. So every time that thought comes in that, oh, maybe I'm struggling right now because God's angry, Maybe I'm not, I'm, I'm not hearing this answer to this prayer that I keep praying because, because God's displeased and what have I done wrong? What's our family done wrong? No, 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 no. We live as sons, not as servants. Second, stop comparing yourself to your spiritual siblings. Just to use family analogies and flush this out a little bit further, if we're all sons and daughters and we're all in the family, not because of what we've done, but because of what God has done, my son, my daughter, they didn't earn status. They didn't out-compete any other kids in, in you know, the nursery ward when they were born. No, no, no. Neither have you. And so we don't sit and we don't compare because comparison breeds judgment and judgment breeds division in the family of God. When we see another son or a daughter that's struggling, another son or a daughter that's not living in line with what Jesus has said, instead of comparing, instead of condescension, we are called to draw close and disciple up. When we see another son or daughter struggling, we're called to draw close and disciple up. Call them further into the family, further into their identity, instead of standing off and saying, well, no, there's no room for that. Because that's not a righteousness based on Christ. That's a self-righteousness applied when I compare myself to others. And it destroys and disunifies the family of God. Third and lastly then, what's the takeaway? The scriptures say definitively, honor God by walking in a manner worthy. That's what you're called to do. 
because of who you are as a son or daughter, because of who Jesus has made you now by his sacrifice, walk in a manner worthy of the calling. Not to earn, but to shine. Not to try to gain, but to point. To point the watching world to a father. See, the the family image is the very image that Jesus used. When Jesus taught his disciples, he taught a parable about a prodigal son. It was a family image to cement for us our standing and our identity as sons and daughters. The prodigal son, who decided that he wanted to cash out of the family, asked for his inheritance early, in effect saying, Dad, I wish you were dead, just give me my money, let me go live my best life now. And he takes the money and he runs and he goes and he blows it all, finds himself in poverty in a city, feeding slop to pigs as a Jew. And in that moment, he says, you know what? My father's workers have even a better life than I do here. So I'm going to return to the father and I'm going to be, I'm going to ask to be commissioned as a worker, as a servant. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says that when that son is returning, while he was still a long way off, the father saw his son on the road and the father ran to his son and embraced him. He ran to his son before the son could earn anything. He ran to the son before the son could even argue that he should just be a hired hand. He ran and embraced his son, threw the best robe over him, put a ring on his finger, and rejoiced that his son that had been lost was now found and returned to the father. Not because the son was asking to be commissioned as a worker, He was embraced because he had never ceased being a son. We walk in a manner worthy of the calling because God has embraced you and me because God views us as his children and his heart, his heart is heavy for us. His heart is heavy that we would walk alongside of him, that we would walk in his ways that we would hold the family values, not just because they, they're good for him, but because they're good for us. It is for our good. And he longs to give us his best, that we would walk in it. I don't know where this finds you, but I would imagine in today's day and age of a performance-based culture, there are some here in the room or online who are still trying to earn God's favor, still trying to prove that they're worthy of his forgiveness, trying to outgood the bad. The Father loves you because Jesus gave his life for you, because you bear his image and his likeness. And in spite of what you have done, he longs to embrace you and call you his own. Maybe today, for some of you, the response is to simply surrender your life to Jesus, to stop striving, to stop waiting, and to just give your life to Jesus. And oh, may today be the day that you realize that you too can be a son or a daughter in spite of what you've done, simply because of what Jesus has done. Pray with me as we close. Father God. How glorious the the richness of the gospel that you and your great love for us would send your son to die on the cross on our behalf. Father, not just to forgive us of past sins, but to cleanse us and give us the riches of glory. So Father, we confess our need of you. If you're in the room and you've been operating in performance Would you be willing to make that step today? Confess your need of him. The scriptures say that when we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. Would you begin right there by simply confessing? Father, I confess my sin. I confess my need of you. I confess my striving and my failing. And I confess, God, I need your perfection, the perfection of Jesus applied to me. Lord, would you forgive me?
And would you teach me to walk in a way that is worthy of all that you have done for me? Lord, that others might see my life but know your name. That they might see what you have done and come to understand that you are a good and gracious Father. So Lord, forgive us for striving. Forgive us for thinking too much of ourselves and not enough of Jesus and the cross. Forgive us and teach us, Father, to walk as an act of worship. We ask it in Jesus' matchless name. Amen.